Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. My God, the presence of the Lord is in this place. And he simply sent me here to continue the conversation that we have been having and that the Lord has been saying to us, untie the knot and straighten out the wrinkles. My God, what a word, what a word, my God. You see, the Lord love us so much that he has given us words and these words that he has given unto us, if we would but just implement them, my God, and allow them to lead and to guide us. We're going to find out, my God, that there is great reward for obedience in following God. The word he wants us to reflect on this morning, it's simply this, untie the knot and hit the reset button. Amen. Untie the knot and hit the reset button. For a lot of us, we are still stuck. We are still stuck. Yes, we went through some traumatic experiences in life. And as a result of that, we are still stuck where we are. And my God, the Lord has been reaching out to you and trying to help you to get up and to be motivated and to move. But what I find just from my time of reflection with him is that it is the opinion of man, my God, that often hinder, prevent, and stop us from getting up and continuing. Yes, when we fall, yes, it is not what God has to say because we don't look to him. We look for affirmation in the world that we're living in and based on what man has to say about the nature or the state of the fall that we have experienced. We find that ah, we put more trust in man than we do in God. But I want to remind somebody before I get started that the scripture says, my God, that ah, we, we, we <laughs> some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. And my hope this morning is that we can sway you, my God, to see it the way the Lord sees it and thus you get up and you can you you continue you untie the knot yes the fall was hard you did something that you like and you're living in the reality and you hate what you did yes yes and yeah uh, everything inside of you were saying not to do it but somehow you satisfy your feelings and your emotion and at the end of you doing what my god you felt that was right even though you know that it was wrong how did you know that james 4 4 and 17 to him that know it to do right and do it not to him it's a sin how do I know what is right or wrong as a child of God? God's Holy Spirit lives on the inside. So an opportunity presents itself for me to do good, bad, or indifferent. I don't just get up as a child of God and just do it. And then at the end of it, I just say it happened. Nothing just happened. I do get to deliberate and I get a choice in the outcome, my God, of where I am today. So where I am today, there was options and opportunity that present itself for me to do some things and I did and if we did not choose the way of the Lord we're living in and with the pain of decisions that we made yesterday and oftentimes when we make these decisions my God we find that there may have been encouragement around you to move and to do this but now the dust is starting to settle and you find yourself all by yourself living in and with the trauma, the doubt, ah, you even go as far where the enemy convinces you to hate yourself because of what you did. But this is what our conversation is about this morning. Untie the knot. Untie the knot. And not only is the Lord saying untie the knot, but he's saying we're going to hit the reset button. In other words, you get a redo. My God, don't you love the Lord this morning? You get to, my God, a redo. My God, and then we're going to talk about the things that we did and how valuable that is, even though it was bad, how valuable it is in our future. Why? Because it gives us insight. We know not to do this. Why? Because this produces that in my life, and because that was painful when the opportunity presented itself for me to incorporate or to make that a part of my life. I am now armed and I can say no to that, but yes to this. Good God, I love God this morning. We have a few passages of scripture that we're going to look at this morning. My, my, my. First one is Proverbs chapter number 24 and 16. Then we're going to go to Luke chapter number 22, and we're going to read from 31 through 34. And then we're going to hop down to 
the book of Mark, my God, and we're going to read, uh, we're going to read one passage of scripture, and then we're going to just close it off. I won't read Acts chapter number two, my God, but that's where we're going to finish this thing off. My, 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 my. So let's begin Proverbs chapter number 24 and 16. And it reads thus, it says, for a just man, fall it seven times. Preacher, did it say an unrighteous or a wicked man? No. The text says that a righteous or a just man, he falls seven times, seven times. So I want us to understand this, not because I'm a child of God. It doesn't mean that I, <laughs> I don't make mistakes and I don't fall and I don't do things to displease the heart of God. The scripture says the just man fall it seven times. You have fallen. I have fallen, and the conversation the Lord wants to have with us this morning is, now that you have fallen, what do you do? What do you do? Yes, it was traumatic. Yes, it was hard. Yes, it was difficult. You even surprised and disappointed yourself. But now that you have to live in the reality of decision that you make that brings about pain, heartache, and misery, the question is, what do you do? The just man, again, fall it seven times. Let me just stay here just for a moment. Ah, fall it seven times. So the first time he fell, he did not stay down. The second time he fell, he did not stay down. The third, the fourth, the fifth, he falls again the seven times, but he keeps getting up. But the Lord simply sent me here to say to you this morning that this time around, it is going to be different. Why? Because the eight, the number eight, it points to new beginnings. It points to new beginning. So we're not going to focus on the fact that we fell seven times, but we are looking forward, knowing that in each time that we fall, there were things inside of us that we thought. We didn't consult the Lord, but we went out on a whim, if you will, and we felt like this was the right thing for me to do. Again, you can't serve the Lord with your flesh. Your flesh and your feelings, my God, they will disappoint you and they will cause and create hurt and pain and misery and heartache in your life. And if you think not, I want you to look in your own life. Look at where you are today. And maybe you're like this righteous man who fell again one more time. And you see, the thing about falling is when we do, if there's a captive audience looking at us, my God, it all depends on who sees me ah, when I fall. It all depends. It all depends. Because, my God, if I'm in the presence of people who ah, I, I, I put so much in and I fall, I tend to ah, just walk away, head in my chest, and I just walk away. And this is the posture that we walk around with when we fall. This is what it looks like. We throw our hands up. How did this happen again? I thought this and I thought that. But again, my God, you've got to know and understand that the scripture says, God says in his word, that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you are never alone. The angels of the Lord encamp around them that fear. I'm trying to, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to behave this morning. Proverbs chapter number 24 and 16, for a just man falleth seven times. Watch this. And he riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mystery. So the righteous and the just, yes, they do fall. We don't walk a straight line thinking that, my God, everything is hunky-dory in our life because we're starting to serve the Lord. No, it is going to get difficult and it is going to get hard and it is going to be trying and it is going to be tested. And when opportunity presents itself for me to do something that I'm going to like but hate what I do, I have to resist. The Bible says that we ought to resist the enemy and he will flee. So if those areas in your life is not developed to where you can resist, we don't fight with the flesh, but we're going to talk about this in Ephesians chapter number six, where it talks about the wiles of the devil, the wiles of the devil, devil, W-I-L-E-S. That's where we, it comes from this Greek word methodosha. That's where we get the word method. So because we understand, my God, the method of the enemy, we can counter what he is inviting us to do. Luke chapter number 22, untie the knot, hit the reset, but not because you fell, it doesn't mean that that is it. Simply mean that you set in motion something that you should not. And my God, you're experiencing temporary interruption. 
But God is going to reconnect the dot for you so you can have continuity in your life. Luke chapter number 22, let's start at 31. And it reads, and the Lord said to Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to sift you as we. Verse 32, but my God, I have prayed for you. Watch this, that your faith, it is your faith. The Bible says that I have prayed for you, watch the text, that your faith fail not. So you can fall. And if you fall and if you don't have faith when you fall, my God, you're going to stay down there. I wonder whose faith, my God, is on life support this morning. And we need to, my God, make uh, 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 it into that space and resurrect life support, my God. Bring the defibrillator this morning and we are going to shock somebody back into life. Peter, verse 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to sift you or to have you, that he may sift you as we, but I've prayed for you that your faith fail. Watch the text. And when thou art converted, the Bible said, no, strengthen the brethren. So there's a lot in that statement because what the Lord is saying is that, Peter, you are going to deny me and you're going to fail me. And you, my God, are going to hit rock bottom. My God, but look at what it looks like, good God, when we have confidence in our own, in our own flesh. <laughs> and Peter said unto him, not only, my God, am I ready to go with thee in the prison, but unto death. And then the Lord said unto him, Ah, Peter, I tell thee, the cock will not crow three times this day before thou shalt deny that thou knowest me. The righteous fall seven times, but he keeps getting up. I wonder who this morning has fell. And you're there and you're deliberated. Should I get up? <laughs> or should I stay? But I want to say to you this morning, get up in your mind and let your faith be activated. And once your faith is activated, my God, we're going to look to the Lord. Mark chapter number 16 and 7. But it says now, so Jesus died, rose from the dead. Peter denied. Peter ran off, want nothing to do with Christianity, fell and fell hard. And want nothing to do with Christianity. Jesus now rose from the dead, Mark 16 and 17. But it says, go your way. Tell my disciples and look whose name is called. The one who fell. He says, go tell my disciple and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. My God, there shall he see him as he said. So Jesus is ridden. He's risen, rather, and when he rose from the dead, he met his disciple. Peter was not, my God, in that circle, if you will. Peter was on the outskirt, ah, having to blame and to kick himself. Why? Because how could I have denied the Lord? You see, when we put confidence in the flesh, it's easy for us to deny the Lord. Peter. Satan has desire to sift you as we. Lord, you have no idea what you're saying. I will even go as far as to die for you. Father, we come before you this morning. And for every conflict that is in our heart this morning, we come, we lift it up, we bring it before you. Ah, maybe tonight, maybe today, just need to be a sermon about conflict resolution. Good God, I don't know who you're after this morning. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But whatever you're up to this morning, God, I'm up to it. Conflict resolution. Our heart is conflicted. Peter, you are going to deny me. Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. I will even go as far as to die for you. Peter, before the cock crow three times. You are going to deny me. You're going to deny. You're going to say you don't know me. You have never met me. My God, a heart that is conflicted. Ah, a heart that is conflicted this morning. My God. Ah, but we come this morning, God, and 
for the heart or the hearts that is conflicted this morning. Come in, O oh God, and we're asking you to help us to untie the knot. You go before us this time, God, because we don't want to go, because if we do, we will continue to do, my God, the easy thing. What makes me feel good? But to stand up in the middle, my God, of a moment where the heat is on, like the three Hebrew boys, and to make the declaration, do what you do, because the God that I serve, he will come and he will see about me this morning. I pray for the heart that is conflicted this morning. I pray for the soul, my God, that is conflicted in the balance, my God, and continue, my God, to do things the easy way. Ah, taking the easy path and the easy road, and thus the areas in our lives that should have been developed, we transition, my God, into manhood and womanhood with these areas in our lives that are still immature, creating issue and deep-seated issue because every time opportunity presents itself for us to grow, it is that area, my God, where we took the shortcut. This area continue to reap havoc in our life. But this morning, we come and we know that you're a restorer of the breach. And so every conflict within us, we present it before you this morning. And we're asking you, to make the crooked straight this morning. Yes, Lord, make the crooked straight so that we're not conflicted anymore. But my God, we are conformed, oh God, to your word. We look to you and we say, thank you, my God, in Jesus' name we pray. Untie the knot and hit the reset button. Untie the knot and hit the reset button. The righteous fall seven times. Not sure if you've ever been there where you were so sure of yourself. Where you stood up like Peter <laughs> and the Lord declared a word to you. There was caution that was sent, advising you, yes, that there's going to be trouble up ahead. But you are so sure in yourself that you decide, my God, to look beyond the caution. Why? Because I've dealt with circumstance and situation like this before. And like Peter, you stood in defiance to the instruction that the Lord gave you. And as you are standing there, <sighs> you find that, my God, the pressure begins to build on the outside. And because there was pressure on the outside, Peter, you're not at the place yet where you are built or you're designed like a submarine. Preacher, where, where, where are you going with this and how is that applicable? You see, a submarine, my God, by its design, it is designed to go in the depths of the ocean. And there was something unique about the submarine in a pressured situation. You see, the submarine, by design, it cancels out the external pressure. My God, that, and, and because of how it's designed, canceling out the external pressure, it can continue, my God, to stay submerged in pressured situation. And what on the outside, my God, does not make its way on the inside or affect, my God, what is on the inside. You and I, like Peter, the Lord has been trying to get this this area in your life and in mine mature and he exposes us my God little by little my God to things that will cause us to grow in this area of our life but because of the confidence that we have in the flesh like Peter my God we stand up on the stage of life and my God we renounce my God we argue with the thing that the Lord is saying to us Peter he says to Peter again my God Satan has desire my God to get a hold of you and not only does he want to get a hold of you but Peter what he wants to do is to sift you as wheat and what they would do Jesus is talking to a group of people who live in an agrarian culture if you will agriculture was their way of life so he's using my God this expression of what the uh, my God the farmers would do when they go and they would gather my God a bundle of wheat like this what they would do uh, in order to separate the grain from the hooks, they would viciously, my God, beat it against a hard surface. And this is what the Lord is saying to Peter. Peter, Satan is trying to, my God, get a 
hold of you. And he, my God, wants to sift you as we, but Peter, my God, I've prayed for you. Peter, I continue to pray for you. Why? Because this particular area of your life, you have not fully submitted it to me. Peter, instead of giving me the reign, my God, to teach you, my God, and to build up this area in my life. Peter, you have taken me out of the driver's seat, if you will, and you have put me, my God, my God, in the back seat, not even in the passenger seat, but you have put me in the back seat. And Peter, your life is on a collision course, my God, of pain and disappointment. The righteous falls seven times, but he keeps getting a preacher. What is this pressured situation that you're talking about? Jesus, my God, is accosted. He is in the Praetorium Guard. Peter, my God, is looking at Jesus being interrogated and being beaten to a, 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 a pope, if you will. And as he stand there and he's looking at his master being beaten to a pope, Jesus, my God, is on trial, my God, some distance away. And Peter's faith and what he professed is now on trial, my God, in this immediate circle. He's standing there and he's looking at Jesus and he's trying to ah, process and understand what is going on. And in the process of this chaos and confusion, somebody comes and taps him on the shoulder and says, you look like him. Peter shrugs his shoulder and says, get away, get away from me. I don't know him. And his gaze is now fixed again, my God, <laughs> on Jesus. Somebody comes again and taps him on the other shoulder and he kind of shrugs it off, leave me alone, and taps him on the other one. What? You dress like him, my God. And he shrugs it off and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's standing there in the cold night and he's warming his hands by the fire. Remember Jesus said to him, Peter, Satan desire to sift you as wheat, and it's this vicious act in an in, 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 in an expectation to separate my God faith and everything that Peter believes in, and he's standing there warming his hands by the fire. And somebody comes, taps him again, and say, Hey, you sound like him. And before Peter could deny sounding like the Lord, the Bible said that the cock crew three times and he remember what the Lord said unto him. And it is in this moment, even though the cock crew, he turned around and says, I don't know the man. And the question is, what do you do? In moments like this, my God, when you have the option to honor your conviction, my God, or to honor compromise and compromise, it's going to cause you to respond the way Peter responded in this moment. He denied Jesus three times, and the Bible said that he ran away and wept bitterly. He ran away. What do you do? If you're not built, my God, like the submarine. In that when the external pressure comes and you are looking, my God, within, you're looking for your own words. You're looking for what your culture teaches you or impress upon you. You're looking for, my God, how you see other family members respond to pressured situation like this because this is your point of reference. And based on what you saw modeled before you, my God, you are not going to take it and you're going to apply the same sets of my God values, if you will, are the same approach. And my God, they may have gotten my God the same result. But again, it's because of all you know, my God, you are just following suit and it is going to lead to heartache, pain and misery where my God, you now have to navigate the reality of this and it is 
painful, my God, when you have to navigate it on your own. You see, it is it is one thing for me to look and to see you going through it and for you to say to me, Pastor, this hurt. And it's another thing, my God, for me to walk, my God, a mile in your shoe and experience the same, my God, type of trauma and the effect that it now has on us. Because you see, when we experience trauma, all we want to do is to be separated from everything and everyone. And I understand why Peter would have, my God, just right away. Why? Because the other disciples, knowing this, my God, I don't know if you ever done something, my God, and people just constantly remind you of the thing that you did. So Peter felt that the best thing for me to do in this moment, my God, is to separate myself and to just, my God, I, 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 I can't believe, my God, that I did this. And I don't know if you've ever been there, my God, where, again, you've done something that you like, but you hate what you did, and you are sitting there, and your ah, your familiar foe or companion, if you will, is regret, and regret is sitting there and looking at you, my God, and it is the type of look that is so upsetting. Why? Because you invite regret to be a part of, my God, that sit down with you. And Peter runs away, and he wept. And it wasn't the type of cry, my God, that is just that, it is that deep sobbing, one where words ah, fail to come. Peter denies the Lord, fell. And when he fell in this moment, when he denied the Lord in this moment, the church, which Peter is a representation of, does not look good to the world. And here is the question, Micah, what do you do as the church when we deny knowing the Lord? What do we do when we deny knowing the Lord? The righteous fall seven times. But he get up. Gets up because the Lord wants the world to see there is restoration. And by you getting up, my God, the world will look at you falling, realizing, my God, yes, there's going to be ups and downs in this Christian pathway. But when you fall, if we demonstrate to the world what to do, the world, my God, will constantly come to the church. But if a brother or a sister fall, and we take it as an opportunity to kick them while they're dumb. This does not look good to the world because that's how the world treat their own. We as the church ought not to treat the fallen brothers and sisters that way. Peter understand the nature of people and he decide the best thing for me to do in this moment is to separate myself from the church, separate myself. And so Peter decided that he is going to leave and he parts ways with the church. And when the leader of the church path, path, pathways with the church, the question is why? Why does the righteous fall? Number one, the righteous has confidence in his or her flesh. Two, lose sight, my God, of faith. And it is our feelings, my God, that set in motion what comes next. And number three, we act in our feelings or on our feelings. So I feel this way, not realizing that the scripture says unto us, that if any man should come after me, let him first deny himself, take up his or her cross, and follow me. Are there options and opportunity that present itself for me to act in a way and in a manner, my God, that is displeasing to the Lord? Yes. But with the opportunity for me to satisfy my flesh, it is the same opportunity for me to deny my flesh. And you've got to remember anything you feed 
in your life will live and anything you starve will die. So we can choose to feed our flesh or we can choose to, my God, feed our faith. And my recommendation to you is that you feed your faith. Feed your faith. Feed your faith. The righteous falls seven times. But my God, he keeps getting up. Falling. Ah, Donnie McClurkin pens this one. He says, we fall down, but we get up. But the challenge for us when we fall, like I said before, it's the fear and it's the opinion of others. It is the fear and the opinion of others. And my question to you is simply this. What are you going to do, my God, now that you're falling? And, my God, they may attribute your past to be one that is colorful. Maybe, like the righteous man in the text, you're falling a number of times. And there are a number of different reasons why you have fallen in the past. And maybe your past is very colorful. And because everybody knows your past, you fail. You don't want to get up. you rather stay in the position that you're in. But the scripture again says the righteous fall seven times, but he keeps getting up. And I want to say to somebody this morning, not because you have a colorful past. It doesn't mean, my God, that you stay down there. Because there are opportunity, my God, for the Lord to redeem you. What comes to mind is the woman who Jesus met at the well. Remember, Jesus and his disciple, they had their day planned. And my God, in the middle of them moving towards what the day's agenda was, Jesus stood up and he said to them, my God, that I needs must go through Samaria. Why are you going through Samaria? Because there is a young lady who has fallen and I need to go redeem her. The text doesn't say that, but Jesus insisted on them, go into the city and buy bread. I needs must go through Samaria. And maybe that's where you are this morning. You're falling and you find yourself isolated. We'll talk about her life in a moment. But let me just pick this apart. You see, Jesus and his disciple, had the disciples gone with him, they would have interfered, my God, with Jesus picking this woman out of the depths of where she was. Why? Because the Jews and the Samaritans, they had nothing to do with each other. So Jesus separated them and said, go into the village, buy bread. I needs must go through Samaria. And when he did, he went and he sat on a well. And he is waiting for this woman who comes, my God, at this unusual time to the well, my God, in order to get water. The time that she would come would be the middle of the day, and this was not the time that the women, my God, would typically go to the well to get water. She is isolated. The fingers are being pointed at her. Why? Because of the colorful past that she has. Nobody, my God, nobody wants to, my God, associate with her. Why? Because of her colorful past. What is that colorful past? When she came and she ah, saw Jesus there and Jesus says, give me something to drink. She looked at him and said, the well is deep and you have nothing to draw with, but you're asking me for water. And Jesus, in a surgical approach, in order, my God, to fix and to eliminate, my God, and to uh, uh, restore unto her the joy of the Lord, which is her strength. He then gets right to the point. He says, where is thine husband? And she said, I've got none. And Jesus said unto her, you have rightfully spoken because you have had five husbands and now you have a situation. Five husbands. That's her colorful past. And you see, for her, there was an issue with relationship because the male relationships were not working because she has been in five, my God, and they did not materialize to anything. And the female relationship, my God, they're not working. Why? Because she's isolated. She don't have a girlfriend to sit and to talk, my God, and to have conversation about what is going on in her heart. So she is isolated in her own thoughts and in her outlook on life, my God. And when this becomes a reality that we have to navigate and to live in with and through, my God, that area of our life become calcified 
and that it becomes hard. And my God, we are not allowing anything or anyone to hurt us again. So when we fall, my God, we become hardened on the outside and we don't allow anything or anyone, my God, to come, my God, near us. The righteous fall seven times in our fall. And my God, the Lord is saying, don't become so hardened and don't become so rigid, my God, because there are opportunities for me to restore you. And my God, just like this woman, Jesus has to work through the layers of issues, my God, that she insulate herself, my God, in order to protect herself from what the culture, customs, and the opinion, good God of man, has to say. And maybe that's where you are. Falling like this righteous man. But every time you fall, my God, you insulate and you calcify and you become even more hardened. And you're more worried about what they have to say than what the Lord has to say about you. This young girl, my God, <sighs> isolated all by herself. And my God, what the scripture says was the reality that she has to navigate. There's a way that seemeth right. Left to my own demise and my own thoughts. Isolated. This is what the enemy wants to do. In and when you fall, get you isolated. So he can begin to, my God, whisper nonsense to you. And when he begins to whisper nonsense to you, we buy into the nonsense. And we forfeit, we abort, my God, the thing or the things that God has declared over your life. Everything that he creates, he does two things with his creation. Number one, he gives it a name. And number two, he gives it a purpose. Purpose cannot change. Purpose cannot change. How do I know that? The Bible talks about as long as the earth continues to turn on its axis, there will be seed time and harvest, and that seeds are planted. Reciprocity is experienced. What is reciprocity? Seeds begin to, my God, reproduce after its own kind. So that's the purpose of that particular seed. When planted in the ground, it is going to reproduce seeds after its own kind. So who you are and what God has created you to do, he has not changed his mind. The only person, my God, who have changed their mind is you because you're not supporting the vision and, my God, the purpose that God has declared over your life. The righteous fall, but not because of falling. It doesn't mean that God has changed his mind. My God, about the purpose that he declared over my life. Again, look at what he said to Peter in the book of St. Luke. Peter, Satan has desire to sift you as we watch the text. But no, it says, when you are converted, when you are converted. In other words, when you overcome this, the Bible says, I want you to now go and to strengthen the brethren. So for those of us who have fallen, my God, this morning, and you find yourself wanting to give up and to quit and to stop, my God, because of the express opinion of man, I dare say this to you, my God, there is conversion that is taking place in your heart and in your life. And you see, it is the conversion that affords you the opportunity, my God, to now stand up on a platform and begin to preach and to teach redemption and to help somebody to understand that not because you are falling that is not it. Yes, you may have fallen, and yes, the trauma of the fall, my God, maybe somebody that, something rather, that rocks you to the core, but my God, get over it and get over yourself, because that is not it for you. That's not it. We fall down, but we have to get up in faith. In faith, yes. Like Methibosheth, my God, can I just preach to you this morning? Like Methibosheth, who fell as a child and was lame in his legs, yes, and you come up with all the excuse, my God, not to get back in the game. But you see, my God, David was restored to the throne of Israel. David made a covenant with Jonathan. And when David made the covenant with Jonathan, he said, listen, man, if I die before you, take care of my family. And if, I, if you die before me, I'm going to take care of your family. Jonathan died in a battle. Jonathan had the son whose name was Mephibosheth. War broke out in Israel, and the nurse that was caring for him picked him up 
and was trying to run with him and to protect him. My God, and just by virtue of his birth, he was next in line to be king. But my God, he fell. The nurse dropped him and he became lame in his legs. And because he became lame in his legs, ah, he was isolated because they didn't want a king <laughs> that was lame. David comes to the throne. And David asks the question, is there another of the house of Saul that I might show kindness to? And my God, Ziba stood up in that conversation and said, there is one, my God, Mephibosheth, but he is lame in his legs. But I dare say this to you this morning, not because you're fallen and you are lame in your leg. You see, physically, good God, you can't get it. But you see, in faith, my God, you can get up because, my God, it is what God has to say about you. And again, purpose cannot die. So who you are and what God has declared, my God, over your life, not because you are, my God, lame in your leg. It doesn't mean that you can't serve and you can't be effective for God. In fact, this is an opportunity for God to use your circumstance and situation to talk and to show his goodness. My God, he sent me here to say to you, get up in your mind get up in your heart, get up in your understanding, get up physically, get up psychologically, get up emotionally, because this is not it for you. Not because you're falling. It doesn't mean that is it. It is not the opinion of man. It's not the opinion of man. It is what God has to say. Do you want him to restore you, my God? Do you want him, my God, to restore you? Couldn't help now but to think of Samson. My God, again, created with a sense of purpose, the Lord said to him, I've deviated from my text, so just permit me to preach to you. I'm just preaching as I feel, feel led of the Lord this morning. Samson created with a sense of purpose. It was declared in the book of Judges chapter number six, my God, that he was created to be a deliverer created to be a deliverer. So again, that's the purpose. You are created to be a deliverer. And Samson, my God, here is what I'm asking you not to do. First and foremost, the Lord asked his mother and his father not to drink anything strong and not to my God, <laughs> not to cut the boys here and tell him not to touch anything that is dead. But again, like Samson, the feelings get the best of us. When our feelings get the best of us, we fall and we fall hard. First thing Samson did, he was coming back, my God, from a bad. They saw a dead lion on the road and saw there was honey in the carcass of the lion, and he touched it. And here is the thing, my God, that the Lord wants us to ponder this morning. What do you do? When, my God, you feel the steady decline like Peter. Peter had three opportunities, my God. When the first, my God, bell sounds, Peter did not do anything in order to correct it. Samson, like Peter, he touched, good God, the dead carcass. And you would think that there would be some type of alarm going on in your mind because the Lord says, I should not do this. And now I find myself negotiating with myself to do something that the Lord tells me not to do. Again, the Holy Spirit is a part of that conversation. So it's you, the Holy Spirit, my God, and the outcome that you're looking for. So I am here and I have a desire to get here. And right in between is the Holy Spirit. So I entertain the thought as a man thinketh in his heart. So I, I, I entertain the thought and the thought moved from my head, my God, to my heart. So from my head to my heart, this is where my God, the Holy Spirit is. So he's reasoning with me, Ian, don't do this. Ian, please do not do this. And he shows me the outcome. But like Samson and you and me and and, 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 and and Peter, my God, we tend to push the Holy Spirit out of the way and we proceed. The first thing he did, he touched the dead carcass. The next thing he did, he drank strong drinks. So don't do these things because if you do, there are consequences and it is going to cause you to fall. And when you fall, my God, know and understand this, that your fall don't only affect you, it affect the persons who are dependent on you. 
my God, I don't know who that is for this morning, but I'll say that again, Samson. When you fall, your fall, my God, does not only affect you, but it affects everyone who is dependent on you. The next thing we know is that Samson lay, my God, in the lap of Delilah, and Delilah pressed him and pressed him, tell me where your strength lie. And Samson, again, not built <laughs> like this submarine where the external pressure by God is being applied. And Samson caved. And when he did, fell. And he fell hard. And think about the hopes of others that rested in Samson honoring his godly conviction. Everybody, my God, who knew of the prophecy that was declared over this young man's life. Know that he's fallen. The Philistine plucked his eyes out. Good God, I need to talk to somebody this morning. And when they plucked his eyes out, they chained him onto a mill, my God. And Samson, my God, this man that stood up and fought for God, they chained him to a mill and he was going around, my God, in circles isolated with his own thoughts and he's grinding grain and the enemy is now laughing at him. Opportunities present itself. My God, for him to stop. Can you imagine his conversation chained to a mill and he's going around in circle grinding the grain and he hear the laughter of his enemies. And my God, again, Regret is the companion that comes and begins to converse. And when regret begins to talk with us, my God, in our fall, it's not an easy conversation. Because, my God, regret can convince us to hate ourselves while we're going around in circle. And he's grinding grain at the mill. And he's hearing the laughter of the enemy. The righteous fall seven times, but he's get a Peter, Satan desire to sift you as we. But Peter, I have prayed that your faith <laughs> remained intact. And while he is walking around in circle, the Bible said that as a sign, my God, of the covenant that God made with him, his hair begins to grow again. And you see Samson in his fall. He felt there was a reconnection with God. But before I talk about the reconnection, let me go and just explain to us what it's like, my God, while we are falling. The Bible said that when you read it, I'll find the text and I'll post it so we understand. Because you see, when there is this, the boundaries, if you will, are being removed and we are exposing ourselves to what's on the outside. We give access, my God, to vital, my God, parts of our life. And the enemy, my God, goes around, my God, like a, a roaring lion seeking who he yeah, is looking to devour. My God, and where he sees there is a weakness, he's going to exploit the weakness. And that's what he did. And the Bible said for Samson that the spirit of the Lord left him. And he did not know. So you see, when we are falling and we give access to things in our life that should not be in our life, the Spirit of Almighty God left him and he did not know. My God, I just want to find this scripture so I can point it out for somebody. My God, the Spirit of Almighty God left him and he did not know. My God. That's in Judges chapter number 20, Judges chapter number 16 and 20. And it says in Judges chapter number 16 and 20, it says, then she called out, this is after Delilah cut his ear. Then she called out, Samson, the Philistine are upon you. And he woke my God from his sleep and thought, I will go out as before. And watch this. He shook himself going through the routine. And the monotony, thinking that God was in the shaking. God is not in the shaking. God resides in our heart. But watch this. But it says, my God, the Lord. But, but he did not know. But he says that I will go up before. 
but he did not know, my God, that the spirit of Almighty God has left him. And he did not know. What a sad state to be in. God's spirit, which is the guiding light, which is our, my God, our, 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 our pilot, if you will, and we are in the backseat, leaves. And my God, you do not know. Can you imagine traveling, my God, from where you are, two, three, four states over, and your GPS is broken, but you have to get to that destination? Question is, what do you do? The internet is down. What do you do? Old school, you get a map and you continue. God's spirit left him and he did not know. But he's grinding at the mill. A sign of the covenant begins to go back. And he repented before the Lord and he said, God, forgive me for my disobedience. My assignment is incomplete. If you will give me the strength, I will walk in obedience and complete my assignment. And the Lord restored him. Fallen, but restored. Peter ran away bitterly. And when he ran away bitterly, he is isolated. Jesus now dies. And he, my God, is nailed to the cross, rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, he came and he begins to show himself to his disciple. And again, the word that we read is that he said, go tell my disciple and Peter. And this is what he sent me here to say to you this morning. He sent me here to tell you that even though you're fallen, he's still in need of you. And I know, Peter, you're looking at the circumstance of your fault. I disappointed everybody. I let everybody down. I get it, Peter, and I understand it. I too have fallen, Peter. But you see, the beauty about it, Peter, is that iron sharpened iron, Peter, and we can come. And we're not talking from a position where I feel you may look and think that I'm at an elevated stance. And because I'm at an elevated stance, Peter, I'm talking though to you. No. Peter, I'm meeting you where you are this morning. And I'm saying to you, Peter, I have fallen. I have fallen. I've made mistakes. Yes, I've denied the Lord. Yes, Peter, violated the commandments, my God, and the principles of Scripture. But you know what I did, Peter? I fall in my face and I repent. And I ask the Lord, to forgive me because I have the faith to believe that he is going to strengthen me in this or these areas of my life. And that's what he sent me here to say to you this morning, Peter, get up because he's not through with you yet. Let me just share a few of these notes with you and then we are going to close. Yeah, get up, Peter. First, you get up in your mind. Say, Peter, this is not it. This is not it. This is not it. Because you see, Peter, just like my God with Samson, while you're down there, the Lord continues to have conversation with you about your tomorrow. How do I get up? You get up. Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. So you're using the word of God to get up, Peter, and you're not using the word of man because man will point the finger and remind you of your painful past. Repentance allow you to put those things that are behind. Forget about the things. Yes, I did it. My past is colorful. You can have it. You can hold on to it. Romans 8, 28 through 31. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. For whom, my God, he did for you, he also predestined 
my God, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of the brethren. Moreover, whom did he predestine? Them he also called, and them, my God, he also justified. And who he justified, ah, is also glorified. What shall we say <laughs> to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The other thing I want to remind you of is what the scripture says in Psalm 37. In Psalm 37, 23, it says that the steps of a righteous man and woman, they're ordered by God. And I just feel like I want to remind somebody this morning of Deuteronomy chapter number eight. Let me just interject Deuteronomy chapter number eight right here at the first part of the 23rd verse of Psalm 37. Deuteronomy chapter number eight, it says something to the effect, remember the way that I take you to teach you, to humble you, and to reveal to you what is in your heart. So because my steps are ordered by God, pointing to F-A-T-E, faith, not F-A-I-T-H, but rather faith, F-A-T-E, which is that predetermined path that we just read about. So a path is handpicked for you. You have to go through this experience so you are converted. You learn what not to do. So you are now armed, my God, with information to share and to teach your brothers and your sisters. If you do that, it is going to lead to that. How do you know? Because I have failed. I've gone through my God, disappointing myself and others. And I am, I've, I've now taken my God, my experiences, and I am teaching you what not to do. The steps of a righteous man and woman, they are ordered by God. And he delight my God in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down. For the Lord upholded my God, him with his hands. Verse 25, I was young and now I'm old and I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor received begging bread. He is ever merciful. He lendeth my God and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. Verse 34, wait on the Lord, my God, and keep his ways, and he shall exalt thee, my God, to inherit the land. When, my God, the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Verse 35, I have seen the wicked in great power and spread in himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, my God, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright. For by God in the end, that man is, let me read that again, mark the perfect man and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Peace awaits you. That's why you have to get up. But the transgressions shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. And my God, he is their strength in their time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them, my God, from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. And if you were to read Psalm 23, it tells you that the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want. The scripture says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. This is something that I want you to write down and take note of this failure teaches you how to be successful. We'll let that marinate for a moment. Failure teaches you how to be successful. You see, when you fail, you learn how to lose. You learn, my God, how to make in-game plan or, or in-flight adjustment, my God, when you experience turbulence. So because you have failed before and you see the telltale sign of things, my God, is going to go awry or it's going to go off course, you can begin to make those in-flight adjustments. You can begin to make those adjustments while you're in the game. Why? Because you have seen it before. And because you have seen it before, you make those adjustments. Why do we hit the reset button like a computer? You will be restored to your former position. The rest button brings you back to that place of potential and possibility. The rest button brings you to that place of pride and prominence. The reset button, rather, will cause you to risk. Gather yourself. 
my God, and reposition yourself to walk by faith and not by faith and not by sight. Failure informs you, my God, of what does not work. Therefore, you are now armed with insight and information of what does not work. And this empowers you, my God, to go all the way. The reset button allows you to get off the train of chaos and confusion. The reset button, my God, allows you to consider the possibility of a better tomorrow and strategically, unintentionally reject the notions and the suggestion that brought you to the place where you are, where pain is the reality, my God, that you have to live in and with. David put it to us this way in Psalm 119 and 17. David said, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn. Peter, it was good for you that you have failed. Now you learn what not to do. Peter, you can now build yourself and build the church to be like a submarine. Why? Because David put it to us this way. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. That is to say, when I entertain ideas and thoughts and those thoughts are making it to my heart, if they do, they are going to come in contact with the word of God that is in my heart, the word of God as a seat at the table of my heart to deliberate over any decision. So it's not just my feelings that are there. It is the word of God. And it is the word of God, which is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path that helps me, my God, to walk by faith and not by sight. So if you don't have the word of God, my God, inside of you, you're going to continue to do something that you like, and you're going to hate what you do. You are going to fall, and when you do, the enemy will come and try to convince you, my God, to stay there. But again, when we read the text, it tells us that Peter ran away, and he went bitterly. This now takes us into Acts chapter number two. You, like Peter, have a colorful history, colorful history. The world around you know of the thing or things that you did, and they are not giving you an opportunity to sit at the table anymore because the worse the fall, my God, is the more, my God, they remind you of it. And the world and the times in which we live, my God, you think about it. Anything that happens, it's not only your community or your inner circle that knows anymore. It's the world. Why? Because of social media. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? My God, can you imagine the amount of TikTok views and all of these different uh, uh, outlets that are there that this would have been captured and just put out there to the masses? And can you imagine how Peter would have been ridiculed, my God? Peter ran away. Jesus crucified, rose from the dead, came and he met his disciple and he sent word, meet me in Galilee. But not only do I want you to meet me, I want you to tell Peter to come too. Because you see, Peter, even though you have fallen, we're going to hit the reset button. The time you had in isolation, Peter, yes, just like Samson, yes, the covenant has been renewed. And you have something to give. And when you get to Acts chapter number two, Peter goes there. It's Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus, my God, ascended. And Pentecost was a time where all the nations, my God, came. And they're worshiping the Lord. And, my God, a sermon had to be preached. And guess who was called, good God, to preach this sermon? Peter. It wasn't John. It wasn't Matthew, it wasn't Bartholomew, it wasn't, uh, it, 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 it wasn't Luke. It was somebody, yes, that denied the Lord, ran away from the church, and wanted nothing to do with Christianity anymore. But you see, while he was out there in isolation, the Lord fixed him. Conversion happened in his heart. No wonder Jesus says, when thou art converted, strengthen the virgin. And the Lord saw that he was repented. He was repent. He went and he repented. And he submit that area of his life fully to the Lord. So he sent me here to say all oh, of what he said, that troubled area in your life. Will you fully submit that to him? Will you? 
because I dare say this to you, if you don't untie the knot and allow him to come in and to fix it. The songwriter says, let Jesus fix it for you. He knows just what to do. Whenever you pray, let the Lord have his way and let Jesus fix it for you. Think about if you ever had a cavity or there's any type of sensitivity with a teeth, with a tooth that you have. You drink anything hot and we get the shock of it. We put it down and we walk away. If you drink anything cold, it's the same. And for somebody this morning, I just get the sense that, yes, there is this area of your life, yes, that you have been living with and you have been protecting this area. But he simply sent me here to say to you, sit in the dentist chair. Yes, because there's going to be some poking and some probing. And you see, the thing about poking and probing, it identified the trouble area and the trouble spot. Peter, Satan desired to sift you as we, I'm good. Ah, the cold water doesn't bother me. The hot tea doesn't bother me. Peter, it does. But if you live in denial, my God, you're going to denounce me. Peter went on his merry way, denied the Lord. And you, my God, I live in. You're, you're, you have this area of compromise. And every time ah, you go through these ah, experiences, those areas come. And when you think that you're strong, my God, the things that you say and do discredit, my God, your belief that you're strong in this area. And the Lord is saying, like, Peter, you don't have to deny me. All you have to do is to fully submit that area. Peter preaches this message. And can you imagine what it's like? Peter is coming out of the shadows and Peter is making his way into the church to preach this, this message to the masses. The scripture doesn't say it, but I believe Peter shared his story. I denied the Lord and I ran away. He told me that this area in my life, my God, was not fully submitted to him. And I stood in the confidence of the flesh and I fell, yes. And I went out there in isolation. But while I was in isolation, here are some things that issue. And when Peter preached this message, the Bible said that 5,000 men gave their life to the Lord. I talked about this and I'm closing now because you see, my God, your fall not only affects you, but my God, while it is true that you fall in the moment and everybody who can see you is affected by it, look at the opportunity that presents itself, my God, because you fell. Not that I'm encouraging you to go and to fall, but if you do, the opportunity for restoration, my God, and conversion can take place. And when it does, this is, my God, the stage that the Lord will prepare for you to share your testimony. He simply sent me here to say this to you, that your colorful history, H-I-S-T-O-R-Y, can now become a part of your, sorry, 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 sorry. Let me, let me, let me give it to you the way I'm getting it. He's saying this, that your history, yes, your history, your history can become a part of his story. So your H-I-S-C-O-R-Y, your colorful history, can become a part of his H-I-S story. It's the same word. But now that, my God, you're fully submitted to him, your history is now his story to tell, my God, because in you telling your history through his story of redemption, others will see it, align with it, and come and fully submit. And this is how the church grew. Untie the knot. Untie the knot. And don't worry about what man has to say. Man's going to talk anyway. Every one of us have a colorful history. But if we submit our history and let it become his story to tell, that's where the beauty is and that's where the redemption is. Father, we just come before you this morning. And we are truly, truly grateful. Grateful, oh God, for all that you have done, all that you do, and all that you continue to do. Yes, we fall down, and we get up. Father, we get up the first time, and we look to see who or what is around us. Did anybody see me fall? We fall the second time. We feel bad about it. We fall the third time, and we continue to feel bad about it. We fall again and again and again. But I'm reminded, my God, of this story. And I feel like I just want to pray and share this, my God, with somebody.
feel like I just need to share this with somebody. My God, I feel like I want to share this with somebody. I feel like I want to share this with somebody this morning. Somebody just pray with me. Ah, I told you I'm preaching like I feel it this morning. Portia Nelson read, or rather penned, the following words. The autobiography in five chapters. Having fallen and fallen and fallen. In chapter one, she says, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am hopeless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever for me to find my way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I do not see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time for me to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. Taking responsibility, she says, it is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. But I like chapter five. It simply says, I walk down a different street. I walk down a different street, untie the knot and hit the reset button. And my encouragement for you this morning, you know what lies up ahead because again, you have not fully submitted that area of your life so the Lord can fix it for you. And my prayer for you this morning is that you go down a different street. Peter, Satan desired to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Why? Because it is my faith that is going to allow me to get up and walk down a different street. God bless you this morning. Whatever that area or areas are in your life, my prayer is that you will, my God, just be honest with yourself and fully submitted to God so he can make the crooked straight because he's not through with you yet. There was a sermon that needs to be preached and it has your name written. Nobody else can preach that sermon, but you have people who are waiting on you, waiting on your conversion, waiting for you to turn it around, to hear what God has done in your life. I made a decision 20 something years ago to walk down a different street. And I'm here sharing with you, my God, what God did in my life. There are persons who are waiting on you. And I dare say this to you, don't keep them waiting any longer. God bless you.